sermon, God was kind of speaking to me for you to hear something a little bit different. But we're going to use the same stories, um, some similar applications, and at the end of it, um, I'm going to stress one important concept, which is the love of God. Um, there was this text message I got, such a profound text message, and that's what I kind of want to use today. Um, it was by this guy named JJ. Have you met JJ before? He was baptized at your church a few weeks ago. He's in Boston. Me and him have been doing a series on relationships. Uh, Brian's kids know where they at. Where's Brian's kids? Yeah, you guys know. He, he and I have been doing a sermon series on relationships, sex, all the great stuff when it comes to relationships. Is it not on? What about now? Is it on now? Nothing? Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, we're good. Cool. All right. And um, his, my, we, we broke it down into a series of few weeks. Yeah, thank you so much. Lower that for a little bit. And, and the week that he had, he was talking about this Hebrew word called ekat. Say ekat with me. Right? It means love. But it's a different type of love. It's not the love that you say, oh, I love fish tacos. Because who likes fish, period. Right? Amen? Um, it's, it's, it's deeper. It's richer. It's, it's the type of love that God has revealed. And he wrote these two paragraphs, and I just have to read it. And this is what we're going to conclude with. So I'm giving you the main idea, and that's how we're going to end it. And then I'm going to work you through a series of stories. Good to see you, sir. I haven't seen you in a very, very long time. Um, and we're going to work through a series of stories, but then this is the main point I want to get across to you. My man, Ruel, is in the house. I am so hyped. I love that guy so much. That's my favorite guy, man. Let's read. Um, well, you can't read. I wish I could bring it on the screen, but we need to get Apple TV connected to that thing. Whether we want to admit it or not, none of us truly know what love is. We go about our days throwing the word around to everything, whether we mean it or not. But love, it is the word. It is the entirety of our existence. God created Adam, not so Adam could love God, but God does not need our love, but so God could love Adam in every single way imaginable. He created Adam so Adam could experience the love that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit shared. A perfect love that isn't just on emotion, that isn't just an action, it's everything. If it were just an emotion, God would have simply continued to love the world. If it were just an action, God would have sent his son. But it's both that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die for us so that he, so much that he never hesitated for one moment to do what needed to be done to save us. So much so that he... That even at the brink of death, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Your idea of a love, throw it away, <laughs> burn it, leave it behind. He's so, like, he's so dramatic, but I love it. <laughs> Instead, love, look to God for love. Embrace it. Feel what he has in store for you. And, what, and with that, do what he commands. Love one another as he has loved you. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Father, I ask that your words be expressed in a way that each person listening in this room may receive something from it. Father, I pray that you be lifted up high above the clouds. Be exalted, O oh Father, so that you can draw everybody to yourself. And Lord, I pray for the soul that needed to hear this message today. Father, adjust it to meet their needs. Father, meet them where they're at. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as you guys know, I love songs. Um, Primarily, that's how I, I really, that's how I just get in tune with the Father at times. It's through different songs, and, and some, sometimes it's, it's through spaces and time. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But one of the songs I really like the most, that I've been listening to kind of on repeat, ask my wife, she gets really annoyed, is called this song called Breathe. It's by this band called Maverick City. Um, and uh, I made this assumption that those of you over 40 will not like this band too much, okay? Uh, why? Because it has a little bit of drums and stuff like that, but that's an assumption based on a stereotype. But if you want to give it a listen, be my guest, Maverick City on YouTube, right? Or if you have Apple Music or Spotify, and the song is called Breathe. And there's a specific, uh, uh, fr um, how do I say this, part in the song, specifically, I think it's like the bridge to the chorus, where the woman is singing this, this, and it just blows my mind away. It says, sometimes you're in the desert, sometimes you feel the pain, sometimes he calms the storms, and sometimes he lets it rain. 
I'll say it one more time. Sometimes you're in the desert. Sometimes you feel the pain. Sometimes he calms the storms and sometimes he lets it rain. And most of us can relate with what this author, this psalmist is trying to say. In other words, there are high times in our life and there are low lows in our life. There are moments where we wish we could relive and moments that we never even faced before. I'm sure you can recall the great moments. One of the great moments in my life was actually being with my father in the summers in Las Cruces when I was in high school. It was like 8, eight o'clock, eight, 8 to 9. We'd wake up, have breakfast, go to the gym. He'd drop me off. I'd play basketball four or five hours. He'd work out in the gym four or five hours. He'd pick up, go to Sam's Club, ice cream, dollar twenty-five. have the ice cream, repeat. Then he'd say, you want to come to church? I'd be like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to the gym. I'd go to the gym, play more basketball, come home. we watch Smallville. Have you ever seen Smallville? <sighs> it took so long for him to fly, man. Am I right? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe some of you don't know what I'm talking about. But anyways, that was the summer of... Of almost three years of my life. And if I could relive, I would. It was bl it was peaceful. I was the only child. It was wonderful. Oh my goodness. Those of you who have siblings, don't understand what it's like to have your own room. Ah, oh, it was wonderful. Then you get married and you go right back to it. Huh? Yeah. Um, and, and, I, I just, I, and if I could relive it, I could. A, a, a low point in my life, I'm wearing his tie, Ken. Uh, it's actually his anniversary a few days ago. And that was a low, low. That was a really low low in my life. And, and, and what the author is trying to express is that there is hardship and pain that we have to endure. And, and regardless of what place you are in, what moment you're in, you go through the song. It's like if you have breath in your lungs, you can praise God. Right? That's the idea that Maverick City is trying to express. That if there is breath, if you wake up in the morning, if you can sing, if you can talk, if you can move, if you can drive, you have a reason to give God glory and praise because there is breath in your lungs. And that is the very first gift he gives humanity. As he crafts and molds Adam, he then breathes into his nostril what? The breath of life. Therefore, it's a gift for you to be alive. The best gift. And so I like how... I was thinking through this. The psalmist is trying to say that despite the circumstance that you are in, right, we can continue to praise God or put it another way that our submission and discipleship to Jesus Christ cannot be dependent on the ups and downs of life. Or, and I like this part, when our expectations meet or fall short. Our discipleship of Jesus has to go, has to surpass our feelings and emotions, our experiences. It must be like that type of love that JJ was talking about, Echa, where it's not just an emotion, but it's an action. While you are being crucified, you ask God to forgive them. That's the type of love God wants for him. And this is, this is kind of key to what I want to talk about today, um, the type of love God has for you. And the type of love that in time you will reciprocate back to him, right? And so uh, one of the best examples I can give to that fake type of love that a lot of us have experienced is I'm going to use the SDA church as an example, okay? How many of you are not SDA in the building? You belong, you do not, you, you're not Seventh-day Adventist Travis, you can keep your hand down because you're just a part of it, brother, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Do I, have no, do I have any non-SDAs? Don't be afraid. I just want to know. Everyone in here? Wow, it's like a cult. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, here we go. So since we're all SDA, I think we can all get this. Have you ever heard of the Sabbath before? How many of you know the Sabbath? How many Sabbath school lessons have you heard about the Sabbath? <laughs> you guys all know about the Sabbath, all right? I make this as an uh, illustration, but something that I've experienced in my life. I'm not saying this is you, I'm saying this is me. In my time of meditation, I kind of realized this. But Sabbath comes around, and, um, and one of the things that I realized in my life is that Sunday to Friday, you know, Cartoon Network, I could watch it. Um, Nickelodeon, SpongeBob, I was on it. Right? Come back from school, I can play any game I want. I didn't really have games or anything. I can go play basketball, football, do whatever I wanted. I, I, it was like it was like absolute freedom six days out of the week, and then all of a sudden I get to the seventh day or Friday night, and the only thing I could watch is Animal Planet, right? And those of you who know, I, I'm not really that fascinated with animals like my brother, but he is like that. Um, and I, 
And then I, as I grew up, I understand that as a child, that was important to understand the regulations and just kind of setting the stage. But then I grow up, right? I grow up with a still immature view of the Sabbath. Here's why. Sunday through Friday, before Friday night, my playlist on my Apple Music was not something worthy of praise. Let me be honest and clear and confess my sins to you. Um, there, I, I don't think that ever, I think there's some wonderful songs that you can even listen to sab on Sabbath that may not ever mention the name of Jesus, but have the principles of the kingdom in it. But if Jesus was in my car, <laughs> listening to the songs I was listening to a Sunday through Friday, he would not be pleased. Then on top of that, the TV shows I watch Sunday through Friday. Oh, have mercy, mercy, mercy. Am I right? Those of you who can understand, can understand. If those of you who are judging me, will forget you, okay? Um, and I, I would <laughs> ask my wife, there was a show I watched, don't ask her, actually, she'll expose me, but I'd watch this show. She looked at me one time, and she was like, what are you watching? And I'm like, I'm on season six, I gotta finish this, right? And then Friday night comes along, I'm a theology major studying the word of God, Andres. So you know what happened to Netflix? It changed from Netflix to VeggieTales Friday night. You know what happened to my playlist? I had separate playlists. Check this out. It was so funny. I had a playlist for the week and for a different motion, and then I had a Sabbath playlist, and so I switched the playlist on Saturday. The things I did on Sabbath drastically changed, but then the moment Saturday night hit, I was back to earth, wind, and fire. Amen? Some of you don't know what that is. It's all good. You youngsters, right? Look at me. I'm like 25 calling you out youngsters. Anyways. And the, the thing that I noticed is that... Uh, as I, I, I noticed that six days out of the week, I'm not really following Jesus, and I don't really live by his principles. I could care less about his principles. I could truly, like, I, it's like six days out of the week, I'm like, all right, God, you need to take off that throne. I know what's best. But then Friday night comes along, and honestly, it's probably based out of fear and just obligation to follow the way of Jesus. And so Friday night is the least I can do. It's where I can get to the, uh, anyways, I had a whole sermon on it yesterday. And then Friday night, I changed drastically, but the moment that the sun goes down, I'm right back to being the king of my life. And I use Sabbath as an example. It's a perfect example in my life to show that, where it seemed that I was God of my life for six days. Friday, Saturday, I gave God the throne, and then I kicked him right off again. I'm saying hallelujah on Saturday, and then I'm saying crucify him six days of the week. Oh, mercy. We're getting in today, Joe. You know what I'm talking about, Joe? We're going in today. And I, maybe you can relate with the Sabbath illustration. Some of you have never had that issue because you've realized that the Sabbath is a gift, not restricting you from anything. And this coming month, we are going to do a Sabbath of Sabbaths. Oh, I cannot wait to show you what we're going to do this month. You're not allowed to touch your phone for 24 hours. Oh, have mercy. But you want to be a part of this. The Northeast Church, you better do it. We're going to do a Sabbath. There's not going to be a sermon. There's not going to be worship. It's going to be a day of rest for you to come. If you want to pray, you can pray. If you want to sing, you can sing. There is nothing on the agenda. We're going to have a Sabbath of Sabbath. And we are going to rest and walk in the pace of Jesus. We're going to do that sometime in March. So we're going to relearn Sabbath. But for the sake of the illustration, imagine you're living the way I'm living, but in every aspect of your life. God, I will let you be God in this part, but this part over here, I want to be the king of the universe. Father, I will give you praise when things are going good, when life is at its peak, but the moment I'm in despair, will Father leave me? I want nothing to do with you. I never knew you. Following the example of Peter. And so I, I want to stress that we, this, this type of submission that we've been talking about here for the Northeast Church for the last two years is that I'm following Jesus cannot be dependent on your emotions. It cannot be dependent on where, when Jesus meets your expectations or fails to meet them. It must be consistent despite the way you feel. You must continue to follow the way of Jesus despite what other people are telling you. Because if he truly is who he says he is, then let him be God and find your place. But that is not the case at times. If you go to Revelation chapter 3, you can't go by yourself. There is this church called Laodicea. 
And God neither calls him hot nor cold. He calls him by this word, this L word. It's not loser. <laughs> Praise God, he doesn't call us loser. Amen? But it's his L word. What is that L word? Does anyone know what it's called? Warm. Warm. Look at that, Marshall. Former head elder. He knows his Bible. Amen? Lukewarm. Why? Because they sometimes choose to follow Jesus. They sometimes choose to be committed to this type of marriage that God is calling them to. And then there's times when they're just like, you know what? I'm good. Crucify. And, and God, it's, 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 we see it sometimes as like a slap in the face, brimstone and fire type of sermon. And that's the way it's sometimes been presented. But I'd like to suggest to you, it is as if God is crying out for Laodicea to please change. It's like a, like a heart-wrenching plea. Please follow me. Why? Because apparently God is making a huge claim that he knows what's best for you. Can you believe it? That the author, the creator of the entire universe is saying that I know how to live. I know what you should do. Therefore, follow me. Stop living according to what you want. Choose to be hot. Don't stand in the middle because it's worse than just being cold. And therefore, I think that God is making a plea with us to follow him, to choose him. And what's interesting is he doesn't force you. And, and the funny thing is, I like this so much about Jesus, is that before he asks you to do something, he's already done it. Before he asked you to reciprocate that type of love, he showered you with love first. We love because he first loved us. Let's go to the life of Jesus, will you? Matthew chapter 21. Andres, you heard this sermon before, but you're going to hear it again. you got to stop following him, man. It's kind of weird. I'm a little worried, all right? Matthew chapter 21. We're going to get Andres to preach one day, amen? Amen. All of you don't even know who that is. It's that young man right there in the blue suit. Don't worry. And when you get a little bit older, I'll find you a beautiful wife. No problem. Your mother will never like her, but we'll still find you one. No problem. Right? Matthew chapter 21. Jesus has been ministering for the last three and a half years. This is the last week of Jesus' life. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, you're reading like a chapter, you're thinking, oh, this is a year, oh, this is another year, oh, this is another, no. Matthew from 21, pretty much, all the way to 28, well, not 28, but from the time of his crucifixion, imagine this within a seven-day period. Do not forget that. Seven days. You with me? I know you're with me. I love you so much. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20, 21, and let's go to verse 1, really quick. Let's read the scripture. Facebook, get your Bibles out. Stop being lazy. Let's go. When they approached Jerusalem and came to, can someone say that word for me? Thank you. God bless you. At the mountain of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her foil. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Who needs them? Specifically that word, the Lord, the master, the rabbi, the one who is high and exalted needs a what? A what? A donkey. I want to take a moment to, to just break this concept down. A donkey. It was prophesied in Isaiah that he would come on a donkey. But when you think of the President of the United States coming in, riding on a donkey, would you find that, uh, you know, boastful, prideful? It would be meek, it would be humble. Usually the President of the United States, well, he comes with that caravan of different cars, like a bulletproof thing, and then he has bodyguards all around him wearing the nice suit, having the nice clothes, probably nice shoes. What about the God of the universe riding on a simple donkey? See, everyone was imagining, and no, let me say this, they had expectations placed on Jesus. Remember I said your expectations cannot be determined the fact of whether you, fall, whether you follow Jesus or not? Everyone was placing these huge expectations of Jesus. What were those expectations? Those of you who are learning about the Bible, this is cool. Let me teach you. 
The expectation they wanted for Jesus for him to become the king, not necessarily of the universe, but their, their view of the world was kind of more, was smaller, kind of, it's more pathetic. They just wanted to be God, king of Israel. They wanted their nation to be like it was in the time of King David once again, for it to restore to its power, to its royalty, because they were being oppressed by the Romans and by pretty much every other nation surrounding them. They were a weak, pathetic people, and they no longer wanted to be trotted on. They wanted to step on others. And so their perspective is thinking like, okay, Jesus, you can heal the dead. You can do this. You can do this. Okay, finally, then you can get rid of these people that are oppressing us, and you can finally take the throne and, and, and establish Israel as pretty much the United States of the world, if you want to say it like that. That's what the people wanted. They had no care about the sins in their life, really. They had no care about the Romans not seeing as just Gentiles, but as brothers and sisters who need to return back to the kingdom. Their expectation was far from the will of God. So therefore, when you have Jesus finally coming into Jerusalem, what were they expecting? They wanted Jesus to enter into the temple, dethrone that stupid high priest, sit on the throne, and then next go to Caesar in Rome, dethrone that terrible leader, and finally reign over the earth for however long they would live, for their children and their children's children. That's what they wanted. They didn't want Jesus to sit at the right hand of the Father, for him to give mercy to those who had even oppressed them. So Jesus comes, and what their expectation declared, he should have come on a white, shiny horse. Funny thing, that's how he's going to come at the end of the age. But Isaiah called him a suffering servant. He comes on a donkey, meek and humble. Kind of confused still. People are like, okay, I mean, like, I can work with this. I mean, Jesus, you'll adjust to my vision of you sooner or later. I'll let you keep doing what you want to do for now. But, okay, Jesus, you'll adjust to what I want you to be. And so they're adjusting, and so you see that as, as you continue reading, go to verse 9, Jesus is entering Jerusalem, and what are they saying? Hosanna! You've heard that song? How many of you know the Donut Man? Does anyone know the Donut Man? Is that just me? Oh, Joe, that's why you're my favorite, man. You know the Donut I grew up on the Donut Man. We sang the song Hosanna with the palm branches, and they're placing the palm branches, they're placing some of their garments on the floor, as God is like, he's on a donkey, so I better make this a little bit more royal, right? I may make this a little better than what he's wanting it to be. And they're saying, Hosanna to the son of who? David. Right? They're saying, Jesus, be like the King David in a sense. My expectations. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Adonai. Hosanna in the highest of heavens. And when he entered, verse 10, to Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar saying, Who is this in the crowd saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. Very interesting. Super, super duper interesting. Jesus is coming on a simple horse. And just, I, I, I want you to see the very first thing he does as he enters the city of Jerusalem. Let's keep on reading if you don't mind. Jesus went into the, verse uh, 12, Jesus went into the what? Temple. Is Jesus, is Jesus doing what they wanted him to do? Yeah, so far, everything's good. And then what's the next thing you read? And he what? Threw out the people he needed in order to make the vision of the people come true. Jesus is making enemies of the people he needs to make friends with. You follow me? If you're really trying to unite the people together to take over the Romans, do you really want to start throwing those people out of the temple? Do you really don't want to make the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the zealots really angry? No, you need those brothers and sisters be next to you. But Jesus, it seems that he's on a different path. He's not meeting their expectation. He's going against completely their expectations. Not just them, but also the disciples. Notice those closest to Jesus don't even know the will of Jesus yet. So have patience, okay, with yourself, okay, as you walk with Jesus. They were with him for three years. You haven't even seen him face to face. Have patience with yourself, yeah? The Bible keeps on going. 
He overturned the tables of money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. I've made this point, and I love to make this point over and over again. Jesus is slow to what? Anger. Does Jesus get angry? You better believe it. This is a righteous anger. How many times has Jesus been showing up to the temple? A lot. His whole life, pretty much. But when does he decide to flip tables? At this specific time. It's not Jesus threw a little fit. No, he expresses anger in the proper way. The Bible keeps on going. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of what? But you are making it into a den of thieves. He's going against their expectations. He's, he's really making a lot of people mad. But then this is what gets me. Sometimes our expectation of Jesus can prevent us to see the love of God. How do I know this? Because your Bible says so. Read with me this. Verse 14. Who came in after he threw people out? Huh. <coughs> The blind and the lame he came to him in the temple and he healed them. When our expectations are not filtered through the way of Jesus, they can not only prevent us from seeing the love of God, but they can also prevent others from experiencing the love of God. Who belonged in the temple? Was it the righteous? Were it those who got it all together? If that's you, you need to get out of here. Straight up. You don't belong. The Bible, my Bible says, Blessed are the poor in you, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not those who have it together. It's not the ones that really don't need a savior. It's the ones who understand their need. It's the ones that can't sometimes make it out of bed. It's those who are so broken and, and just torn down by sin. Those are the ones that are said, that are told to come and see, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Those are the ones who are invited into the Northeast Church. The broken. And then what's funny is, they were healed by the Messiah himself. So therefore, our expectations of Jesus can not only prevent us from seeing the love of God, but they can prevent others from, from truly experiencing his grace, his mercy. But I don't want you to Lose sight of this point really fast. Notice Jesus. He's doing the will of the Father, not the will of his children. Interesting. And, and, he's, and he's doing miraculous things. What people should have been rejoicing over. It says that in verse 15, when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did. And the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna. Who are shouting in the temple? I don't want you to forget this point. Who are shouting? One more time. Who are shouting? You're going to hear about them in just a second. Shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were what? What does your Bible say? Mine says indignant. What does yours say? Displeased. Notice that you, if you really are not willing to just let go of those expectations, you will be blinded to your blindness. We need to be willing to say, Father, not my will, but let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Go this week and meditate on that scripture, but let's keep on going because I have a point to make. Then, I want you to flip your Bible if you can. I want you to flip it. I believe it's Matthew chapter 27. I believe. Yes, Matthew chapter 27. Jesus has been doing a good, uh, plenty of few things in the temple in Jerusalem, making a lot of people mad. He finally, he crosses the line with, their, with these individuals, the scribes and the Pharisees. It seems like Jesus is just not going to bend to what I want him to be. It seems that he's not going to stop being the son of God. So therefore, I need to put an end to him. And so, they come up with a plan. They get Judas, the Iscariot. To betray Jesus for how many pieces of silver? Funny, I think it's, how much is Joseph too? What's Joseph like? I think it's the same amount. It's parallel there, I don't know what it is, but that's interesting, it just hit me. And, and Judas, 
The funny thing about Judas, if you've read in the Desire of Ages, chapter 76, one of my favorite books, Judas had this expectation of Jesus for him to be the king of Israel, just like the scribes and Pharisees. And Judas was just so upset, and he's just like, why won't you just be what I want you to be? So Judas goes and betrays Jesus, not because he hates Jesus. He doesn't hate Jesus. He just wants Jesus to finally step up to what he wanted him to do. So he's putting Jesus almost like in a corner. It's either you will die or you will submit to my way. Oh, you got to go read Desire of Ages, I promise you, chapter 76. It's bomb. It's literally bomb. If you need a book, let me know. I have it in the closet. Or there and there. So I'll give it to you for free. That's the beauty of the church, right? And so he goes and gives Jesus a kiss on the cheek, I think. They take him. Peter gets all upset. Cuts a guy's ear off, Right? Hopefully, I'll, I'll ignite anger in Jesus' heart, and, and finally he'll fight back, and then Jesus touches that guy by the ear and heals him. The guy who's about to take him to the cross. He heals him. Hmm. And those who live by the sword, what? Something we probably need to meditate on this week as well. I'm giving you so many things to meditate on. And Jesus goes, he's beaten to a pulp, smacked, spit on taken to this guy and this guy but this guy i like really i like Pilate. i really like Pilate. he's a pagan but he seems to have more mercy than the jewish people than they do and he knows nothing of the torah what i mean by the torah is the law the first five books of the bible the mercy that god had on israel when he removed them from egypt yet Pilate is more merciful than they are notice what happens when you won't let go of your expectations go to chapter 27 with me to verse 23 Let's meditate on the final moments of Jesus' life. Will you? How much time? I don't care. You can leave any time you want. Then he said, What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, what? Crucify him. Who's shouting? Go back to chapter 21 really quick. Flip. Just have your hand like this. Okay? Sounds good? Go to verse, verse 15. When the chief priests and scribes saw wonders that he did, and the children, what? Shouting. Go back to chapter 27. But they kept shouting. Go back to chapter 21. The children shouting, shouting. Notice how quickly what they shouting changes from just seven days. From Hosanna to what? <laughs> That's funny. God, you could be the God of my life. No problem. Then something happens. And all of a sudden, you're saying, get off that throne now. I need to be the God of my life. Father, you are so good. You've been so merciful the last year. Oh God, help. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then next month, we're going to be crying out, crucify. We think we are so different than these people, but if we just take time to examine our hearts, we will see that we can relate with them so deeply. How quickly we forget how good God is the moment we face trials and tribulations. And at that moment, or even the moment that we are, are faced with either letting go of our expectations or simply trusting Him. We choose not to let go because we want to be the God of our lives. We choose to take a bite of the fruit like Eve because God is withholding something from me. He's restricting me. He doesn't know what's best for me. Therefore, I need autonomy from God. Therefore, I cry out, crucify Him. And notice what Pilate says. It says, when Pilate saw that he was getting what? These people are beyond convincing. But that a riot was starting instead. They were so fixed on what they wanted, they were willing to kill others for it. He took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am an innocent of this man's blood. See to, to, to it yourself. And they grabbed him, and they crucified him. Notice what the people say in verse 25. All the people answered, His blood be on us and our what? Have mercy. And they released Barabbas <clears throat> to them, 
And after having Jesus flogged, they handed him over to be crucified. The point I want to make, various points, but one point I want to make, is that we got to let go of those expectations. And our discipleship to Jesus cannot be based on emotion any longer. It cannot. When you say, I do, it's not till I feel some type of way. It's till death do us part. And when you step through those waters, you said, till death do you part. But the thing is, why should I follow Jesus? Is because he is the manufacturer of your very bodies. And when you buy an expensive product, what do you usually do? You read the manual because the manufacturer knows how to make it work so therefore why are we trusting god with our lives when he knows what's best for you he's not withholding you from peace he's leading you to peace he said i have come that you may have life and what life abundantly john 10 10. therefore fall to your knees and say god not my will but let your will be done and even if you cannot see, God, I will trust you. Jesus could not see past the cross, but he still said, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. The, this, the last point I want to make is the point that I really wanted to stress, and I'm wrapping up. Jesus is asking you to trust him. He's asking you to let him in. And the question is, why? I've thought this through. Some of us use fear as a motivation, right? Jesus is coming back, and if you want everlasting life, you better give your life to Jesus. That just sounds like it's true, like you can die any day. You're absolutely right. You can leave here, die in a car accident, and we'll be doing your funeral next week. That is so true, so honest. Your life is like a vapor in the wind. I think it's James chapter 4. But that cannot be the motivation why you give your life to Jesus. Jesus is not even promising. He promises you everlasting life, but Jesus is more concerned about the life you're living right now in the present. Amen. Did you know that? Yeah. Therefore, if you have made a decision to follow Jesus because something that, that's going to happen in the future, I think we need to reconsider. There's, there's other, 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 like, you know... Other ways that we have tried to convince people, we've, we've tried to like bear them down by guilt and shame, like you were dirty, you were disgusting, like you better give your life to Jesus, like all these different things. And those are very true as well, but that cannot be the main motivation. I, I want to suggest to you the best motivation you can possibly need, the one that should move your heart is seeing him on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Amen. Why? Because while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Thank you. The best thing about this gospel is not that we'll have mansions in heaven. <laughs> it's not about the gold on the street. It's literally on the street. That means you walk on it. It's pathetic. It's not even... I dare say eternal life. I would suggest to you, it's what Travis said earlier, it's the fact that he'll never stop coming after you. He will never give up on you. He's going to get you. He's going, it's like there's a poem, it's called the, uh, the Heaven Hound or something like that. He will continue to pursue you because his love for you surpasses all understanding. You are loved. Amen. And when you finally realize you are loved, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that when circumstances arise in your life where you have the option to either say hallelujah or crucify him, when you live by that reality that I am loved, that God wants what's best for me. He's after my joy. From the very beginning, he said it was good, not for himself, but for you. I promise you, in time, you will learn to continue to say, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So, how? You may be asking, how? How can I, 
How can my discipleship to Jesus, my relationship to Jesus, my marriage to Jesus not be consistent on my emotions, the ups and downs, or, or even my expectations when they meet or when they fail? I dare say we need to change our perspective on the way God views us and loves us. And from doing so, when we see the love of God, the widths, the depths, go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3 with me. And this is how we're going to close. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to be looking at the last verse, last verses of Ephesians. If I ever preach the last sermon in my life, it will be on this chapter. It says this, verse uh, 14, that's how we'll close. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and, and firmly established in what? Love. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length, the width, the height, the depth of the love of God and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Amen.